Wyverns are an incredibly diverse order, from having theropod-like animals, to more traditional dragons, to even partially resembling large felids. But there can be no doubt the most aberrant and derived of the group are the cave wyverns Kezu and Giganox. Completely adapted for a subterranean lifestyle, the two present a number of bizarre adaptations to explore and questions to try and answer, from both their similarities and differences. How do they detect prey in lightless environments? How do they reproduce, and why is Kezu such a deadbeat parent compared to Giganox? So, where to begin with both of them? A good start would be to try and determine just what type of cave animals are Kezu and Giganox. There is a unique subset of zoology known as Spelea biology, literally cave biology, that seeks to answer this and gives four types of cave-dwelling animal. Troglozines, which are effectively just occasional visitors. Subtroglophiles, which often rest or dwell in caves but are dependent on the outside world for one reason or another. Eutroglophiles, which are animals that can fully survive but aren't completely dependent on caves. And troglobions, which are completely cave-dependent. It's kind of hard to decide which Kezu and Giganox are. From these, I would likely say troglobiont or eutroglophile, as it's unknown just how dependent the two are on caves. Considering mountainous and tundra environments can often be quite dry due to the wind, it may be possible Giganox is a pure troglobiont. Outside of the mountains, though, Kezu often lives in humid areas with plentiful cover, so it may be possible that in rainforests and wetlands, Kezu may be more of a eutroglophile. It's quite hard to say. But with that done, roughly, how does one live in a cave? What adaptations do you need for this sort of lifestyle? Among other things, cave-dwelling vertebrates show resistance to anoxia and starvation. As well as just having lower energetic requirements, one study found that subterranean salamanders can last for huge periods without food by significantly lowering their metabolic demands, and then utilising energy sources in the muscles too after their fat stores had run dry. This combined drop in bodily activity, locomotion and oxygen use meant that they lost condition three times slower than a more typical salamander species also undergoing its own fasting response. The salamander species used for this experiment is one known as an olm. It's a blind cave salamander that lives exclusively in the Dinaric Alps, and is Europe's only cave vertebrate. This is a prevalent creature in Slovenian folklore and our species history of believing in monsters as when washed out of their cave rivers in heavy rainfall, they were believed to be the spawn of mountain dragons. It's amusing to think in the world of Monster Hunter, people thought the same thing on finding a washed-up Kizu whelp, only to find out it was actually technically dragon spawn. Or even better, if they first thought it was some species of ugly cave leech, and that none of the proud and powerful wyverns of fire and thunder could ever be so revolting. Kazu seemed to have extensive fat stores, and combined with their very sluggish behaviour, it does seem to suggest that they're pretty low-activity animals. It's not unreasonable to imagine that they can also pull some similar tricks in regards to their metabolism and activity, slowing it down for long periods to exist off their extensive fat reserves in a stationary existence, until they detect fresh prey entering their caverns. Paradoxically, Giganox the Tundra Wyvern doesn't seem to have the same extensive fat reserves or compact, rotund body shape for heat conservation, Giganox still does have a wet, flabby hide, and so likely has a reasonable layer of blubber, which with its quite large size would still give it some reasonable insulation. It seems likely that Giganox, the quicker, more mobile wyvern, is more active and relies more on energy expenditure for warmth in very poor conditions too. It's also described as freezing meat in caves, and so can rely on its larder in lean times over having to slow its metabolism, to the same extent as Kizu or an Ulm at very least. Neither Kizu nor Giganox share the Olm's position in folklore or legend. Most people outside the guild either don't know they exist, or don't really know what they are, outside of some hideous grey wyvern in a cave to be feared. But due to the unique biological properties and those of their bodily fluids and organs, the guild have a great interest in cave wyverns, and they're often requested both dead or alive for further study. Such study has already resulted in what is effectively a very potent energy drink, as well as possible leaps in the finding of harnessing electricity. There's also that one weirdo at Capcom who genuinely seems to think Kezu looks like an absolute snack. But in terms of what Kezu and Giganox like to eat, how do they actually find things to eat without functioning eyes? As both are described as blind, as you can also clearly tell just by looking at them, Kezu is said to have an extraordinary sense of smell, 
which would definitely fit, and in his fight he can be visibly seen sniffing out the hunter. But scent particles can go everywhere, especially with mobile prey leaping all over the place, and can also be foiled by various chemical attacks like dung being thrown in your face, or noxious chemicals being exuded. So both cave wyverns likely don't just rely on smell, but what else can they use to detect prey without eyes? Giganox is said to detect body heat, and for a long time it's frequently said pit vipers and related snakes' sensitive pits were primarily designed to detect heat only. But more recent research has found that they can actually detect differences in temperature either way, too. Albeit with a preference for the warm. So they can still locate colder prey in very hot environments. Despite being often described as purely heat sensitive, they are there to sense thermal contrast above just pure heat. There are limitations to this though in that low thermal contrasts can result in reduced accuracy. It's possible this could be the same with Giganox. Another method could be the very carbon dioxide bodies emit without even breathing. Ticks have an organ on their forelimbs called the Hawler's organs. These sensitive organs detect heat, pheromones, and CO2. If you ever find a tick before it finds you, you can watch it in action by moving your fingers back and forth in front of it, and it'll move its limbs to follow your finger. While it's quite delicate, this would allow for precise targeting of living prey. It's also worth noting this is one method of detection that's very hard to block. Most insect repellents that successfully block the chemosensors still fail to block the tick attraction to CO2. It seems to be one form of detection you just can't hide from. All these sensory adaptations can also have other uses too. Their detection of pheromones can help cave wyverns find mates, or avoid each other in caves, as well as allowing them to detect changes in the humidity or temperature to help them find the best spots to rear young. Now, all of this may sound very limiting and arguably quite inefficient for hunting. How are such slow wyverns meant to catch swift prey with such delicate sensory organs? But it's important to remember that like ticks and vipers, Kezu and Giganox are primarily ambush predators that allow their prey to come to them. The caves of the monster hunter world in the wetlands and rainforests are damp environments chock full of fungi and invertebrates. They're very attractive feeding spots for animals like moss swine, bullfango, and congas that are very frequently found foraging in these areas. And it's animals like these that likely form the bulk of cave wyvern diet. They're not especially fast, and are often very noisy foragers too that rely on scent or sight for congas, first to detect danger. The silent approach of the mouth of a cave wyvern in the dark would very likely go undetected until it was too late. Ayoprey also seem very fond of caves as refuges and are likely frequently consumed as well. In frosty environments, caves will likely provide important shelter from the harsh wind chill and frequent blizzards that will make them a very attractive refuge to smaller monsters, ones like Blango, Baggies, and Anteca. Despite the refuge they provide, the chilly caves would also still be a very high thermal contrast environment for anything with warm blood, allowing for an easy hunt for any Kezu or Giganox. For the most part, the cave wyverns effectively just sit at the end of a conveyor belt with their mouth open, and let the food come to them. But in cold areas like mountains and tundra, it's possible they may hunt actively, out of hunger or lack of prey arrival, for one reason or another. Cold environments with the highest thermal contrast between their live prey are likely the only such areas that facilitate this behaviour. However, for the two of them, active hunting may effectively result in them still using ambush, just outside of a cave. If Giganox uses its toxic secretions for predating its food, as well as preventing its own predation, it may hunt like a puff adder, or rattlesnake, lying in wait to strike before following the dying victim to where they fall and can be consumed. Way back in Rathalos and Rathian's video, I believe their venom to be hemotoxic, and for this style of hunting it would likely be the same, giving the Giganox a warm blood trail to follow to its meal. Hemotoxic venom can frequently seem to cause bowel and bladder release as well, this would only strengthen the trail for the Giganox to follow. There is also a case for it being cytotoxic as well. This is the venom that effectively melts you. Giganox doesn't seem to have a mouth that can function as a properly hinged jaw like other vertebrates, instead almost having a leech-like sphincter. So Giganox may benefit from partially digesting its prey via venom as it doesn't seem like it can do very much mechanical digestion via chewing. Somewhat oddly, Giganox is described as freezing excess kills in its caves in a larder, and Giganox doesn't seem to have a mouth well suited to processing tough, frozen material. It's possible Giganox just gets around this by being a small prey specialist, only eating things it can swallow whole. Luckily, the mountains abound with such species, though. Although a final interesting point to consider regarding Giganox, specifically, 
is that it may be greatly limited in its active predation by weather conditions too. Many polar animals can be quite hard to detect with thermal imaging as they're so well insulated against the cold. In some cases they can even develop a layer of built up frost or snow on their coats. In high wind chill conditions or snowstorms, Giganox may have to retreat to its caves due to struggling to sense prey in conditions that would result in greatly lowered thermal contrast. Prior to Rise, I probably would have believed the same thing about Kezu, but footage from the game shows he can actually bite things off and properly chew. Kezu probably doesn't have an especially strong bite force, with the elasticity of his head and neck region, but this also means it doesn't really have to have much finesse eating, it can just wrestle off a piece of carcass and swallow it whole. When outside of caves, Kizu probably hunts very much like his intro in Rise, waiting near water for better electricity conduction and the likelihood of animals coming down to drink before stunning them, finding them at leisure and then eating them. The reproduction of these two wyverns in particular is quite tied to their hunting methods. Kezu is often said by the fandom to stun live prey and lay eggs in it, like the various Amophilia and Podolonia wasps do with caterpillars. But it's worth noting this has never been canonically said. The wiki does reference this, but as Bandlagaikris and others openly admit, a lot of it is speculation too, along with other contributors. That said, it's not an unreasonable hypothesis. Kezu can stun large prey, Kezu has offspring that seems to latch onto still living things to start feeding. Bingo. Like Lagaikris and electric eels, Kezu still probably has some control over the voltage it can put out. It may often stun prey because it's much easier to find it if it's still alive and emitting body heat and CO2. It may also want its prey alive for its offspring just because this will make it last as long as possible, as it means environmental decay will only set in later. Eating it from the inside out will obviously kill it at some point, but Kezu whelps may instinctively avoid vital organs to keep their living gingerbread house alive as long as they can. Kezu may also be selective over the targets for their young. The parasitic wasps themselves are actually selective with the caterpillars they select for their young too whereas others exhibit something called mass provisioning, and just dump one massive caterpillar. Because Kezu likely doesn't move the victim after stunning it, it's effectively a greater amount of food for effectively the same amount of effort. There is also the heat provided by the victims. Compared to their parents, whelps are seemingly quite small when born. Small enough to be carried without being over-encumbered, but large enough that they can only be carried singly. Something this small probably needs some help surviving in cold environments. With large herbivores, they continue to remain warm several days after their death. The fermentation in their digestive organs means they will stay at quite a warm temperature for considerable time even with freezing outside temperatures. For something like a bison that this finding came from too, the large size and thick fur will only help trap the heat further. So for something like a popo that has these factors as well, it's a perfect host. The kezu stuns an adult, lays the whelps in it who swiftly begin feeding and likely have a rapid growth rate in the early stages of life. Even after they've eaten enough that the popo dies, it still remains a warm, edible fortress until it's been completely consumed. It's also possible that actions of the whelps in the body too help generate heat, just as maggots create their own microclimate on a large carcass. Only once they've hollowed out all the edible material, do the whelps finally unzip their grisly sleeping bag and emerge to the world as subadult Kezu. Kezu likely still use Aptonoth or Slagtoth in warmer areas, whose size and fermentation will still keep the whelps warm in the still quite cool caves. But for the heavy snowfall temperatures of mountains and tundra, it's likely a popo is needed. But what about Giganox? Giganox we see actually has some form of parental care, and carries its young with it. For one, this is a form of protection. Whilst Giganox is still vulnerable to a lot of other tundra predators, its altrical young, called Giggies, I'd have called them Giglets, can be eaten by just about anything. Invertebrates that also carry their young like this seem to do so chiefly to protect them from predation, both from other species and themselves as well, as one reason wolf spiders carry their own young with them is so that they can attain some level of maturity before leaving without the threat of their own mother accidentally eating them too. On top of this, heat is also a factor. It's suggested in scorpions that in very harsh conditions, the mother may provide some help. And where does Giganox live if not in very harsh conditions? The body heat provided by the mother is almost certainly vital in the long-term survival of the Giggies. Finally, nutrition may also be a factor. Giggies apparently hatch from eggs, but are kept in a gelatinous lump of what looks like spawn. As well as keeping their skin damp, it's quite likely that similar to amphibian spawn, this is edible and serves as a block of nourishment for the Giggies. It may even be possible that it goes further than that. 
Cecilians are worm-like legless amphibians that create a layer of fatty, nutrient-rich skin for their offspring to pull off and eat. Ew. It may be that more of these spawn-like tissues are secreted in the inside of the tail of the mother Giganox for her young to feed on much like Cecilians just on the inside. Presumably, Giganox look after their young for a short while in that the slow, clumsy offspring are clearly dependent on her, and vulnerable to the cold and predators. But the mother may not produce more food to scale with their body size as they continue to grow and become larger and more energetically demanding, so competition will build between her own brood for both food and space within her tail. Eventually, larger siblings may even eat smaller ones. It's hard to say at what point the young are booted out, but maybe around the size of a man, as this seems to be the last size where you could still fit a reasonable number of them in the tail. It may be Giganox boot their young out at the end of winter, so they have a rich spring, summer and early autumn of bulking up and feeding before their first winter weeds out another layer of them. Some Giganox seem quite lacklustre in the defence of their young, often just leaving them there when predators, i.e. hunters, are around, whereas others will deposit their spawn sac directly onto their back for superior protection. This difference likely comes down to the personality of the Giganox in question, and specifically their shyness or boldness. The spectrum of these two traits are perhaps the starting block of learning more about animal personality, and effectively deal with how an animal reacts to new items and places, how it learns, takes risks, its interactions with others of its own kind, and responses to stress. The traits of either shyness or boldness are seen and can be measured in just about every taxa, regardless of cognition too. So for Giganox, shyer individuals are more likely to ignore or abandon their offspring, knowing that they can just make more, and prefer to flee unencumbered, potentially leaving their young to distract an opponent. Bolder individuals are more likely to place the egg sac on their back to protect it, and to stand and fight too. This particular behaviour may be considerably rarer, as Giganox may naturally select for shyer individuals. More neophobic ones that stick with their mother are more likely to eat first, conserve energy from her warmth, and be better protected than bolder ones exploring all over the place. In short, they'll likely grow larger, quicker and healthier than their bolder siblings and have much better chances in life. There is also the red kizu. It's often stated red kezu are normal kezu and the white ones are in fact albinos, but once again I haven't actually seen any official source for this. In cave salamanders completely lacking pigment, gradual exposure to light does seem to cause them to darken over time though. It seems likely that red kezu could be individuals that either live close to the surface of caves or spend more time out of caves and thus have begun to develop more pigment. This would suggest that the natural pigment a kezu produces is red, and so it's up to you as to what counts as a normal kezu, but it may also suggest that the kezu ancestor was red as well. As for Baleful Giganox, it is classed as a rare mutation and one that's quite hard to justify. It's sort of understandable for Venom usage to turn to fire over time, but Thunder isn't really dependent on the creation of stored fuel in a gland, so much as a different organ to create the charges. It could be Baleful Giganox are actually a derived subspecies to the point of even being a potentially different species, albeit in the same genus. Baleful Giganox doesn't seem to have quite the same mastery over electricity as Kezu do and their rarity may come from them being outcompeted by Kezu or normal Giganox where the two coexist. A final question could be how exactly would such a wyvern like Giganox or Kezu first come to be? Despite their popularity in fiction, no large true cave animals really exist, as caves are such a nutrient poor environment. The reason so many specialised cave animals are often small and aquatic is because the rivers often sweep nutrients down from above to supply the fauna. The rest of them are often insects with very minor energetic needs. But let's see if we can't engineer a possible scenario for the cave wyverns to arise. One thing to start with is that both of them are very heavily derived, and this divergence almost certainly took place tens of millions of years ago. But what would the ancient ancestor look like? As I've said before, I believe the common ancestor of most wyverns was a wing drake like animal, and I believe this to be the case here too but likely a more diverged one that was nocturnal and quite bat-like in function, one that roosted in cave systems and already had notable adaptations for low-light foraging. The cave systems they lived in could have had certain passageways that were a lot harder to get out of than they are to get in, as a lot of cave systems often do, and drop-offs that were too tight to allow for full wing extensions, so after falling into a lower cave system they then couldn't escape. Over time, enough animals could build up in the lower systems of the cave that a very small population forms. But what are they eating? For one, each other. 
but also the bodies of various animals, especially colony members that died and fell to the lower levels of the cave, or were carried there by underground rivers. Also other animals that came in from the outside world drawn by fungi or carrion and then fell down various holes to their death. This is important as the initial colony gives the regular food resource that could potentially give the energetic subsidies for such animals to arise. This would also begin a selective pressure for an improved sense of smell to detect this carrion resource, overhearing or sight that would be better for live prey, as well as selection for a lowered metabolism and ability to store excess food and energy as fat. Similarly, adaptations for climbing in the tight spaces of the lower caves, plus the added weight of stored fat, would mean that climbing becomes selected for over actual flight. Give it a few tens of millions of years and these pressures may cause something to evolve that resembles a kezu. Once they're good enough at climbing too, they can potentially leave the caves, or at least access surface level environments to intercept prey entering. This is important as it means they aren't energetically subsidised by the initial colony of wyverns they derived from anymore. As presumably some factors in the world led to the extinction of this ancient owl or bat-like wyvern. The cave species can now spread from the initial cave it arose to form new populations potentially outside of the caves, in rainforests or wetlands, or by migrating to new caves. Eventually one would reach the icy tundra and various nearby mountain ranges. If the cave ancestor hadn't developed its thunder sack yet and had more conventional reproduction, then selective pressures to keep its young warm and alive in the cold conditions would lead to the ancestor of Giganox. All of this is pure conjecture and hypothesis on my part. You may have your own ideas, or even actually be a Spelea biologist and thus have far more informed views. But that's why videos have comment sections, and so please do let me know what your own theories are with these two, both overall and for the evolutionary path that created them. So in terms of thoughts, I do quite like the pair. Design-wise, they're honestly some of the best with the creativity involved. I think Kezu especially shows just how much the team managed to squeeze out of the original flying wyvern skeleton even in the first game. I do think Giganox is the more aesthetically pleasing wyvern, but then when has any cave dweller ever looked appealing? I think the fact Kezu just looks so ugly and misshapen is deliberate, and a key part in its design. In terms of their fight, a lot of people really don't like Kezu, but I've never really seen the problem myself. He's easy to learn and just requires some patience. If he was some Elder Dragon threat that you really had to hustle to take down, I'd get it. But he's a mid-game wyvern at most, so it's not really like there's enough challenge here that makes him feel broken. I also quite like how Kezu doesn't really pursue you. You have to go to him, which is very fitting with his behaviour. Also, it makes him a complete cakewalk if you use ranged weapons. Giganox is the better fight, but I think some people can really run away with that. The constant area of effect poison attacks aren't exactly a laugh riot to put up with. I'm kind of disappointed Kezu didn't really get any turf wars in Rise, and relatively few environmental behaviours too. But then with the more aggro monsters and less focus on behaviour and ecology, that's a complaint I'd have across the board with Rise, from what I've seen and played so far. I don't feel we only need one cave leech wyvern per game too. I'd happily take both of them in one game. So the question of Giganox or Kezu, I prefer to answer with Giganox and Kezu. Just put Giganox in the mountain caves and Kezu in the swamps and rainforests. Thanks for watching. And as ever, thank you for all your kind words on recent videos. Especially as I was a little nervous uploading the Jurassic franchise one. To address some of the points from the bird wyvern video, got it, Glavinus is big brain. But one thing that was sort of mentioned here to consider in regards to cognition is that complex behaviours do not necessarily equal high cognitive abilities. Various invertebrates like eusocial insects and jumping spiders can have very complex behaviours, but these are all automatically coded into the instincts of the insect. It doesn't have to learn or think about doing these really, intricate as they may be. Zephyr Sakes also suggested that Gypsros may frequently eat Neuropterans, with how effective his flash is against them. Using his flash for predation is something I never really considered, despite the fact this is literally what Sitsi does. So good one for spotting that. As ever, likes and ideas are both welcomed and appreciated and I do read every comment. So if you're new to my videos, by all means consider joining up. Requests are coming in now, so please do keep them coming. For newcomers, just as a heads up, most of the Iceborne Returners, I am waiting for the Iceborne art book to come out. Obviously there is a time point I'll go ahead anyway without it, but they're all noted and on the list. For some of the more extreme animals, I do want some more direction from canonical info. So for things like Mother Mirandosaurus, will likely be a while off yet. Thank you as well to both everyone who has already joined, and to those who have brought their friends in too. Next week will be a pretty big medley video, 
But before we get there, I thought I'd start a vote on what the next non-Monster Hunter topic should be after the next batch of Monster Hunter videos. The two I had narrowed it down to were either Primeval's Future Predator and a quick look into Spec Evo, or a deep exploration of the world of Peter Jackson's King Kong, diving into the book The Natural History of Skull Island. Either way, it'll be Spec Evo o'clock. With more to come, as your boy got his first dose of the vaccine last week, so I won't drop dead of COVID anytime soon either. On the note of Spec Evo 2, Altshift X recently did a video on Ken Kozeman's All Tomorrows that's well worth a watch. And that particular book is one so bizarre I was genuinely unable to form much of a solid opinion about it. But for next week, here's a ton of calls at once that you should hopefully be able to get at least one out of. I'll see you then.